Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all our global participants, and welcome to the collaborative Layer 1, 2, 3, and 5G Growth Project webinar, Powering 5G in Industry. The 5G Growth Project looks to deliver a scalable, open, and applicable 5G solution for vital industries like transportation, energy, and Industry 4.0, by providing freely accessible documentation, standards, and guidelines. The project hopes to play a key role in allowing Europe's industrial companies to take maximum advantage of 5G revolution and use it to transform their service delivery. Today's webinar will consist of six exciting sessions spanning two and a half hours. Each session will culminate in a short Q&A section, so please ask questions throughout the session within the chat function, and these will be put forward to the speakers by your chair at the session's conclusion. All participants will be muted, and please do not activate your videos for the duration of the webinar. Well, without further ado, I will pass over to your chairman for today's webinar, Carlos Fernandos, Associate Professor at UC3M in Madrid. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. I hope you can, you can see me and, and hear me well. So thanks everybody for, for joining. We are gonna start at our first webinar on, on fighting and industry 4.0. We are gonna do a small change on the agenda so we are going to start with the with the second uh, plan slot. So the view from the verticals, and in this slot uh, we will have uh, two presentations: one from Simone Panucci, Panucci from uh, Comao and Jesus Alonso from Inno, Innovalia. Both of them are in the industry for the zero uh, area, and he will they will present their view on how 5G can uh, can improve the industry for the zero business. Uh, so. I guess we are going to start with uh, Simone, right? So Simone, please. Uh, yep. Go ahead. Yes. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, sorry. Good morning to all. Nice to meet you. I'm Simone Panicucci. I work in Kumau as R&D engineer. And actually, uh, Kumau has involved uh, this project uh, in, in the last year. And actually, what we are talking about today is how we have declined the use of 5G and its performance in our field of the manufacturing. Uh, before going ahead, actually a few words about what actually Kumau do. Uh, Kumau is a worldwide leading company regarding uh, automation and uh, <coughs> it has mainly three business units. Uh, two of them are showed actually in this picture. As you can see, we have the Automation Systems BU, which actually is in charge of design and developing all the production lines and so on, as you can see. Our main market is the automotive one, but we are starting in the last 10 days, in 10 years, sorry. Uh, we started opening to other markets as well uh, that we call general industry. The second uh, business unit that we have, of course, is the robotics. Uh, all the red robots are the made in Kumau. And the third one that unfortunately you, you don't see here is the powertrain machining. So, the Kumau is involved in 5G uh, since uh, 2017 with the national Italian project uh, 5G for Italy. Uh, in that year, we established a, par a real partnership with uh, Ericsson and team. With the first one is, of course, the technology provider, both uh, software and hardware. Uh, meanwhile, team is the service provider and the, the main contribution, let's say, is uh, in the spectrum. Uh, in the 218, we all together went to the Mobile World Congress in Barcelona. And as I said, uh, the, the previous year, we have uh, started uh, the collaboration with the partnership in Five Growth. Actually, this year, we, we were supposed to participate at an overmass, but unfortunately, we, we couldn't. Um, the main objective regarding this partnership and so our participation in the, the Five Group project is the idea to have just one uh, and for our requirements private 5G network which guarantees uh, 
every every everything's connected to security and of course uh, we have to save money uh, in two different paths the first one is uh, uh, in reducing the maintenance costs and the other one is in reducing the total cost of ownership uh, of course uh, we can have uh, other savings uh, uh, due to the reduction of the use of cables and network hardware and uh, moving uh, some functionality some software functionality that we have nowadays close to the actual field far in the cloud uh, and of course in a securely and scalable way uh, another key point of using a high performance wireless technology in manufacturing field is to have uh, an high flexibility in production plans rearrangement as well as an easy deployment for new machinery or sensors uh, just before going to the actual use cases, uh, uh, some high-level information. In Komawa, as I said before, we have chosen a uh, private 5G. Uh, the image on the left, uh, in some way, sums up uh, this uh, this point. In fact, uh, quite all the all the pieces of the 5G uh, are actually deployed in our premise, with the exception of the HSS and the orchestrator, which, which is actually hosted by, by Tim. Uh, the performance that you can see on the right actually are the performance de declared by the, the standard, and so they are in some way the, the final objective of the 5G. Uh, the main ones for us are, of course, the one millisecond for the latency and the five nines of availability and reliability, since uh, uh, all the communication between robots or automation as well uh, are really, really extremely fast, even really less than one millisecond. And of course, the availability and reliability is one of the, the key points for us and for the functionality of the line. Uh, also, the other uh, performance regarding gigabytes uh, per second in downstream, upstream, and the device density, it's really important for us. In fact, as you can see in this image, there are many, many uh, components and machineries, and so it's not too much complicated to reach the one million for kilometer square since uh, in uh, <coughs> there are not too much if you if you have some calculus let's say uh, just for proceeding uh, 5g uh, of course there, there could be many a huge amount of different use cases in different scenarios uh, that could use 5g but in some way uh, 5g as its uh, its main uh, its main focus uh, on three dimensions. These three dimensions actually uh, referring to the low latency, the huge density of device, and the huge bandwidth. In fact, with uh, uh, massive IoT or machine ma or massive machine type uh, communication, we are talking about, uh, uh, let's say, the IoT in general. And so as you can see in the left corner of the, of the picture, we have in some way sensors or so big data or something like that. Uh, on the top edge, uh, instead, we have the enhanced mobile broadband, and so we are referring to the huge bandwidth that uh, the 5G uh, provides us. And of course, this can be used for many different things, but as you can see, the more, uh, use, the more useful use case uh, regarding this demonstration are gigabytes in a second or 4K screens or streaming or something like that. Uh, what is really critical and the key point, as I said before, is uh, the low latency and so the ultra high reliability and low latency. And actually, all these three uh, main directions is, uh, are the one that we wanted, that's Komau and that's 5 Growth, to test in our scenario and our plan. That's why uh, now we start with the actual use case. This one that you can show now is the first use case regarding the digital twin. As I said, is regarding the uh, low latency communication. The uh, actual objective is to provide to the plant manager or whoever is in charge of managing the, the manufacturing uh, live information regarding what is actually happening on the floor. Uh, giving uh, to them a digital representation of all the equipment, all the processes and on everything what's, what's happening. Uh, to, to go in concrete, this use case uh, regards uh, a robot, which is uh, the one uh, up in the image. This robot is connected to the 5G through uh, a 5G terminal. Uh, since uh, nowadays there are no components, let's say, ready to put into a robot to, to directly connect it to the 5G. And on the other hand, we have a 5G smartphone and a PC, 
uh, which uh, talks to uh, HoloLens. HoloLens is uh, uh, augmented the reality device provided by Microsoft. And unfortunately, it cannot connect directly in 5G. And so we have to put that Wi-Fi channel between the HoloLens and the PC. So uh, what uh, is used uh, 5G for? 5G now uh, is used in the bi-directional way. In fact, both the 5G smartphone and the PC can send in real time uh, position to the robot, motion to the robot. So we, we are constantly saying to the robot where it has to go. And as feedback from the robot, we receive its uh, position streaming. And so we can populate with this, with, the, with this data, the digital twin that we have in the HoloLens. So just to give you the concrete idea, uh, we have the, I don't know, the, the plan manager or whoever else that has to wear these, uh, these glasses. And uh, it, it, it sees, he sees that uh, uh, on, the, on, the back, <coughs> on the background, uh, it has the, the, the reality. And uh, on top of that uh, are, let's say, uh, showed some, uh, some information. And in this case, there are actually the exact uh, motion ex ex perfectly synchronized between the real robot and the, the virtual one. Uh, this is a really key point in, uh, in manufacturing from my point of view, since uh, remote controlling in general could really change the paradigm uh, about how automation is nowadays programmed. In fact, uh, every machinery is uh, offline programmed. Uh, instead, uh, with this kind of technology, with this performance and these cost savings, uh, it, it could open the door to a more flexible and adaptive uh, solutions and, uh, and, manufacturing and uh, machineries, reducing as well the deployment cost and time. The second use case is about uh, the telemetry and monitoring. And in fact, we are talking about the edge of the triangle that was about density. Uh, the actual testbed uh, that we are working on in, the, in this project is the one on the, on the image, on the top of the image. We have five robots and we have some other machineries like electrical motor, IOs and PLCs. And uh, actually everything is connected through uh, a 5G to our remote monitoring platform that is the Kumau IoT platform, which is able to uh, give to the plan manager warnings, error, as well as, as, well as uh, plan the, the maintenance in order to avoid um, breakdowns of the line, uh, since in manufacturing processes, uh, all, every kind of sudden stop it has really a notable impact, uh, a notable economical impact. And so predictive maintenance in some way is, are, is becoming crucial uh, in order to anticipate and mitigate the failures be, before they actually happen, let's say. Uh, with this scenario, as I said, we are just trying to, to test uh, the, the 5G density managed to uh, capability to manage contemporary publishing uh, uh, data from a really a huge amount of sensors. Just think about that uh, uh, in Melfi, the FCA plant, we have more or less around 500 robots. Uh, each robot uh, has six axes, and so if you put one sensor for each of them, we have really a huge amount of the of, uh, device, which in the case of the robot can produce up to one gigabyte per day. So we are really talking about a huge amount of data to, to stream. Um, as I said before, predictive maintenance is a key point, first of all, to minimize the MTBF, which is the mean time between failures. That is a really valuable point in manufacturing scenario. Uh, the last use case instead is about the enhanced mobile broadband. So we are talking about uh, the, the high bandwidth. Uh, the use case actually involves, uh, sorry, actually involves uh, um, a problem in a, in a real plant far uh, from where the expert, the right expert to solve the problem actually is. And so we have on the local plant uh, um, a person that is not really skilled to do that, to, to, to perform the task. And so we are imagining that uh, he can wear the, the same uh, AR glasses that we have seen before, just to, on the one hand, stream what is actually happening on the floor to the remote expert. And uh, uh, the remote expert, expert can as well send 
in augmented reality some procedure in order to perform the task successfully, even if uh, that person, that local person, doesn't have really uh, a huge experience about that. Uh, this uh, same tool could be used as well, not just for, for this use case, but also for training purposes. In fact, we can, we can use uh, these procedures uh, streamed on the AR glasses in order to train the, the new people of the maintenance crew uh, for, for, training, uh, for training purposes, of course. Uh, the, the main objective is, of course, the reduction of the mean time to repair, and this is uh, uh, obtained with the streaming as well as the maintenance training. And on, on the side of the 5G, the requirements, of course, is to uh, being able to stream the high quality uh, video and on the other hand, to, to deal with the contemporary usage of other streamings as well, as well as uh, training activities. So just to really quickly sum up uh, everything that we have said, uh, the use cases that we have chosen for five growth are, are really being chosen to demonstrate all the technical and concrete feasibility of the 5G along uh, its main functional areas. And depending on the technical requirements, it's important to, to know that uh, uh, we don't have to every time deploy 5G as a private network, uh, but we can choose also other deployment in order to reduce the total cost of ownership. And the 5G performance, as we have said before, can help in changing the paradigm about uh, how the automation actually work. And as well as 5G allows a, a really complete changing uh, uh, instead of Wi-Fi or something like that, since it has a dedicated spectrum that could be really critical in order to avoid congestions and degradation of the, the signals, as well as a flexible management dependence on the use case, thanks to the slicing. I have completed my presentation, and thank you for the attention. Thank you very much, Simone. Uh, perfect timing. So uh, now it's the turn for, for Jesus. Please go ahead. Okay, good morning, everyone. This is Jesus Alonso. I work at Innovalia uh, as an R&D engineer. Uh, and I'm going to present here the, the Innovalia use case for Connected Worker. First, let me introduce, uh, sorry. What's happening? Oh yeah, sorry. First, let me introduce the Innovalia Group. It's an alliance of technological, technology-based companies, SMEs, located in the Basque Country, in the north of Spain. And basically, we support our customers in the strategic definition of the digital transformation processes, the development and deployment of digital solutions or the internationalization, internationalization and the valorization of the intellectual property. The fourth branch of our activities, which is the one which is involved in the, in the Five for Growth project, supports the, our customers in the improvement of the quality control processes and the deployment of metrology solutions. All of our products and our services share a key feature, which is at the same time, one of the essential values of our company, of, of the group, which is the development of our own technology. We have uh, our, our headquarters in Bilbao, but we have uh, many other offices and also international partners. And we work with um, all kinds of sectors. The most strong sectors are uh, aerospace and the automotive se se sectors. Our range of products cover all the needs regarding the dimensional control from the CMM, the coordinate measuring machines that we will take talk later, describe later, uh, which we have them from all sizes and, and for all kinds of pieces. The optical sensor, which provide accuracy, high accuracy and high speed. All kinds of accessories, checking fixtures, positioners, and calibration tools to obtain the, the maximum precision. And uh, our software solution, M3, that provides a whole in one uh, place to unify the programming of the measuring cycle, the simulation, and also the inspection and, 
and the, and the report of the results. With all that, Innovalia provides a, a, a complete uh, solution to, to, for the dimensional control and the high precision measuring of sensitive parts. In the Innovalia group, we believe innovation is key for success and for the future. So Innovalia is strongly committed with the development of new products and services based in this case of, of 5G. Uh, and a proof of that is our participation in the in the five growth project where we have uh, a use case related with a remote operation of quality uh, equipment before going into the into the use case description i would like to show you a small video so you can see what a coordinate measuring machine is Basically, it's a machine that uh, measures a piece traditionally uh, with a sensor, with a contact sensor, which is the one you're seeing on the left, that it touches the pieces and then measures uh, the, the, the coordinates. With that, we can obtain uh, different geometries and, and, and things. On the right side of the screen, you see what the operator sees on the computer, which is the digital twin. And there is this black um sorry this black uh, window here which is the program with the def different steps on how uh, of where the robot has to move to measure after the all the measuring procedure we get a report which in the case of the of the contact uh, sensor is quite simple just indicates the different points where it has been measured and the deviation regarding the respect to the reference values. Okay, this is the basic uh, contact measuring. I will show you another video, very short also, about the optical sensor. The contact sensor is very slow as a Sorry, I think the volume is too high. It can measure up to 400 points in more than 15 minutes. While the OptiScan is much faster, has a lot of, uh, it's using optical technology and it can measure almost 4 million points in half of the time. Also, it's, easier to avoid collisions as you don't have to contact the, the piece. And of course it increases the productivity as it's much faster. The reports are also much richer as we have on one on the left, the traditional report and on the right, the heat map or the color mapping, which is a much richer information. So sorry for the volume, I think it was too high. Um, the, the, okay, now we know what uh, um, the process is. When a, new, when a customer wants to measure a new reference, which is not a new piece, but a new reference, first we have to, uh, he has to send us the CAD model so we can work on that and offline in our offices, in our premises, we design the quality control program. Uh, and we simulate it to make sure that we get all the desired uh, uh, geometries and all the measures we need. But the final step uh, before being able to measure all the, the products, all the pieces that are being produced, the first we have to fine tune and uh, make the final setup for the, for the machine. That means that uh, there are two options, either the customer sent us a piece uh, and we can do that then in our premises with that piece or we travel to their uh, premises and we perform this last step there. We usually do this last uh, option. We usually travel there because many times pieces are very big like a car frame or some pieces of the, a plane motor, uh, a plane engine. So uh, most of the time we have to travel there. In this pilot, our objective is to set up a remote control system 
to be able to perform this last step uh, from our premises directly. So for that, we, we need first, uh, well, this is our classical use case, uh, classical scenario. We have uh, the CMM uh, with the control. This is the one that translates the orders to voltages and, and everything. So, and we have directly connected a PC with our software M3, so the operator can manipulate it. The first step in this scenario is to separate part of the, of the software into an edge device and connect this to the 5G network. We also need a camera, high definition camera, to see uh, what is going on, where is the sensor, and what is the, the, are the pieces. We also send this information through the 5G network to our premises, where we have developed uh, an interface with that gathers uh, the, the image from the cameras and also has a virtual uh, joystick that replaces the, the physical joystick that we have in the, with the machine. So this is a basic scenario where we would also need a, a person here still because uh, someone has to put the piece in the, in the machine, but this doesn't need to be an expert. The main requirements, uh, technical requirements for this use case, on one side we need MBV, EMBV slides for high definition 4K video streaming. Also, all this operation is very sensitive as we need to, uh, and then the, the sensor is a very expensive component and if it crashes with a, with a piece, for instance, it could, it could be harmed and, and we don't want that. So we need URL ultra low latency for the control of the, of the machine. Uh, some somehow we compare this to surgery of course, it's not that critical, but uh, but also it's it's very important. And also synchronization between video and control. Of course, we cannot uh, have delay on the video because otherwise uh, it would be very difficult to to deal with it. The main benefits of this use case is a reduction of the of the trips of of our, our staff to to the customers premises but also the increase of the of their availability as they don't have to spend time uh, traveling and whatever we can uh, deal with more customers and that means reduce the also the, the response time of our of our staff so this is basically the the use case uh, but for us this is only a, a door open to new services that we can develop uh, in the future like remote maintenance of, of, of machines and equipment, remote control to, to remote, to be able to do remotely all the quality control process, collaborate between machines, um, generate new kind of reports with, uh, with augmented reality or also of course training and, and development and skills development. So, uh, for us, uh, 5G is a door to new services, as I said, and uh, we are just starting and we are very uh, glad to be collaborating with the 5 Growth project in this, in this, with, this, with this pilot. So that's all from my part. Thank you very much. Okay, Jesus, thank you very much. So now is the time to to see if we have any questions. So I, we, we don't have any question in the chat. So if somebody has a question, please type that uh, in the chat, either for, for Simone or for, or for Jesus. I will just wait one minute in case somebody makes any, any question. Meanwhile, uh, Diego, maybe you can you can prepare as you are the the next one. Okay, sure. So, yeah. So Diego Lopez works for Telefonica, and he's gonna talk about the uh, slice capability exposure as a neighbor for NSS as a service. So, uh, since we don't seem to have questions, so I'll, please, if you have questions for any of the previous presenters, 
even though we are going to go through with Diego now, please uh, type those those questions into the into the chat. So I think are you are you seeing my, my screen? Oh, no, sorry, no. I didn't. Uh, I didn't click the uh, magic button. Now you you should be yeah. seeing it, yeah. right? Okay. Go ahead. Okay. So hello, good morning, uh, Diego. Diego Lopez Telefonica, I, I will spare you to introduce you with the, uh, the company. I, I guess you should know about it. And if, you, if not, you can, you can ask me later on. Uh, basically, the idea is to, to introduce how we see the possibility of uh, combining public and non-public networks in, uh, to build uh, slices that go beyond the edge among other things, because precisely this concept of the edge and with all these uh, developments on, on edge computing and the concept of uh, around network slicing, the idea is that precisely those edges are becoming more and more uh, blurred by the normal use is uh, when you talk about the, uh, the typical distinction between the local and the, and the, uh, and the one, uh, wide area networks is becoming um, in terms of, uh, of um, performance, in terms of management, et cetera, is becoming more and more uh, uh, fussy. And the idea is that it's natural that the, uh, the uh, vertical, in, in the industrial cases, as it was shown by Simone and, and Jesus before, and in others, it's very, it's very reasonable that the vertical organizations that are planning to use advanced network services would have to extend the slice concepts and have a, a, an integrated way of managing the network services and the, and the network uh, um, <clears throat> features that uh, the, uh, doesn't stop as a, as a single demarcation point when you say, no, no, I, I don't want to know anything about what you're doing or what is happening from that point on. So the idea is, uh, is to, to include the, or, or to uh, address the combination of public and non-public networks which is important here is that we're not talking about about normally we use the term non-public because non-public includes private and those networks that are not shared by others so generally it's anything that is not operated in a shared way by the um, by, by a public uh, uh, communication service provider and the idea is that precisely this combination is uh, is something that is desirable and is uh, is uh, we, we believe there will be a, a high demand in the future from the side of the uh, of our customers. The important thing is that here what we have to to <clears throat> make is a is a mechanism stuff for consuming these uh, these uh, network services and, and well as you can imagine and and I'm following the successful uh, uh, cloud story. What the uh, and this as a service paradigm, the idea is that uh, think in terms of a network slice as a service as a way of delivering these services and, 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 and supporting this integration. So, uh, basically, the idea is to use a, a technique or a, or a, a concern a separation of concerns that uh, uh, has two views of a, of a particular network uh, slice instance when you're running the, the network slice. And you have uh, you, you separate these in, in two four ways of, of looking and, and dealing with uh, this instance. One is the uh, what is it? the resource facing the one that is internal uh, to the uh, uh, to the network operator. The other one is the customer facing that is the, the that exposes capabilities and certain uh, possibilities of, of of controlling or monitoring the uh, uh, the slice uh, to the uh, to the customer and here rather than as i said before rather than a physical uh demarcation point a physical separation that we have this is the router and be, beyond the router i don't know anything and behind my router i'm, I'm sovereign and i do whatever i I, uh, I want to do the idea is to have a mechanism based on abstraction that on the one hand is much better uh, aligned with the way in which we we pro provide uh, services or we're planning to provide services right now and second is much more uh, flexible and can be adapted uh, to, uh, to different situations and different requirements. The idea with this uh, customer facing view, precisely as I said, is, is, is to avoid this uh, fixed uh, point in which uh, the uh, demarcation is a binary, is a, is a, is a singularity in the network and to, and to allow the uh, customer a certain uh, degree of control to some of the, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, slice instance uh, uh, features that have been provided by the, uh, 
mobile network operator and combine them with the, uh, with the non-public uh, part and go beyond passive end-to-end -end monitoring that so far is, the, uh, is basically the only, uh, uh, the, the only capability that is allowed to a customer. And it goes, if you think about it, it goes in, uh, in generalizing the uh, uh, idea, ideas that have become very popular right now, even commercially, like uh, SD1. Well, how do we propose it? Well, we propose it by, by uh, addressing something that we, we have termed uh, as capability exposure. So the idea is that you decide which are these, uh, uh, the, the, uh, these capabilities in terms of uh, both uh, accessing data and uh, mechanisms for, for controlling the, uh, uh, how the network service uh, instance is behaving. Basically, this is a general reference architecture that we will keep using in the, in the rest of the talk. Is, uh, as you say, as you see here, the idea is that, as you see at the top, the uh, abstracted view of the network is that you have a slice that is provided by the mobile network operator, that is the blue thing, uh, and, is, uh, and that is extended to a generalized uh, a network, uh, uh, network slice instance by attaching it. Uh, some some pieces of the uh, <clears throat> of the non-private uh, so, sorry non-public network on the uh, and, and and this has to happen at, at two at two levels is is uh, at the I mean on the bottom level what you have is that well you have the two planes you, at the data plane we're talking about interconnectivity and when we're talking about basically if you think about it in the in the basic aspects is the is the pure uh, mechanism that we have had always that is that you have an attachment point and you and you have to uh, define the routing and the addressing etc to to happen uh, that has to happen there with additional requirements on the data plane regarding with for example a certain degree of programmability of uh, dyna dynamic control at least and a different degree of, uh, of data collection and monitoring to satisfy what happens at the uh, management plane in which what you have is mechanisms for, for uh, interworking in the, of the different uh, requests for control in both directions, it's important, and to expose certain functions to the, between the, the two domains. And on the left-hand side uh, as well, you see the different technological domains that typically the, uh, uh, an environment uh, of a public network has uh, right now, dealing with virtualization, dealing with the uh, with RAM and dealing with the uh, core and, and transport in general. So it's, uh, it's the, the, the whole, I mean, how you divide the whole mechanisms by, uh, by, mechanism, by, by, uh, by the, this view of integration that uh, is integrated by uh, means of a, of a general orchestrator or a general controller, depending on how you, <laughs> which school of thought you belong to, and normally has a, a general uh, API for programmability that typically in these days is based on, on REST. There are two phases, as in, I mean, uh, this is something that is evident when thinking about uh, network, anything as a service, and in particular, network service as a service, is uh, where you need to make a, I mean, the, the customer needs uh, to make a request. As a, in terms of a service order using, um, we, we have been working on this, uh, using a, a descriptor in which, uh, in which uh, the, the customer puts the data about how to build the slice, Topology, and we're talking about for sure an abstract topology according to how the uh, um, operator is exposing the, um, its, uh, its network, plus whatever the requirements are that applicable here, whether it belongs to the predefined uh, uh, slice uh, classes, whether we go into a much more, that would be possible as well in the future, that we go into more detailed way of controlling the requirements. And one, one thing that is very important is precisely among those requirements, is precisely the exposure level, the kind of functions that you want to be uh, accessible and you, have, you want to have some control comes. Afterwards, it's uh, during the operation, the, the, according to these uh, ex exposure level that has been requested and agreed during the, uh, uh, during the request phase, the idea is that uh, the, um, the, uh, the customer will have, have some degree of, uh, of uh, access for two main, two main uh, uh, kinds of, uh, of uh, functionality. One is, is the access to the, to the data in order to, to, to retrieve, the, uh, uh, to retrieve uh, the data regarding uh, performance and uh, faults, et cetera, and some degree of control as well on 
the on the slides, and we will see later. Uh, uh, the the uh, uh, we will see later on which are the different levels of control that we have thought that are reasonable. When it comes to the uh, to the templates, as I said, uh, the templates are based on uh, uh, templates are based on uh, on, um, on a, pre a predefined or, or, or a, a predefined um, um, oh, let me predefined de description language that allows to define on the one hand the, the topology that doesn't imply that in the in the request you can put directly and this that depends on the level of abstraction and normally it's not the case that you put, put detailed requests per each of one of the management domains the requests uh, can be i mean the the, the uh, what you request can be much more uh, high level abstracted it's not that you're going to say i want that uh, particular Nodes for radio, or you are simply uh, uh, declaring a general topology according to the abstract topology, and exactly the same in the requirements. Is precisely the uh, mechanisms for translating these requests into into actual actions in the uh, in the uh, operator domains that you translate them on, on particular um, um, a particular. Uh, I do not. I don't want to say request again. <laughs> in particular, control actions or, or, or the deployment of certain um, functions on the uh, on the operator's domain. Uh, it's, a, it's something that is important is that we are not reproducing exactly the same on the side of the customer. But for obvious reasons, normally the uh, non-public network should be of a, of a smaller dimension. Probably it would not make sense to consider four different technology domains. And probably several admin domains that can happen in the on the side of the of the operator, and and, and then there is uh, something that at least in the, this model that we are thinking from the for sure from the point of view of the uh, public uh, uh, network operator, we are we we are open to several uh, poten potential architectures as long as these 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 uh, um, reference points are applicable, and in fact. This is something that is under discussion and we are participating precisely in possible architectures on the side of the, uh, of the, uh, uh, of the non-public network. Uh, Five Growth is working on this as well and is something that, uh, well, it uh, will be elaborated uh, uh, later on. What we think, I mean, I'm talking about or thinking about the precisely different levels of, uh, of exposure and how uh, this operation can be exposed. We, we have defined so far four different levels uh, according to four different um, um, uh, degrees of, uh, of control on the whole uh, slice uh, function, functionality and, um, and infrastructure. At the top, I mean, the, the simplest thing that you can do, and so, so level one, level two, level three, level four, level four is the highest. You have control of more, almost over, over everything. Level one, level one, let's say, is the, is the basic. Uh, the, the basic one is that what you have is that uh, basically, I mean, the, the applications that you have at the end, you can config management and, and request the, let's say, the, the, the basic mechanisms you normally put on the, uh, at the at the endpoints of a, of a network connection, so you could uh, well try to uh, assign your a, a particular um, a particular bearer or a particular quality of service as is offered by the network end to end, uh, etc. If you go into a finer detail and you uh, uh, want and the customer wants to have a control on the particular network uh, at the particular network semantics routing uh, quality of service etc on the different segments the slice subnets if you like to be uh, to be precise and the, and the network functions we go uh, now into into uh, uh, we go now into level two afterwards is something that if uh, uh, a, 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 Former level of uh, of control is that you can deal with the VNFs and their orchestration. It's something that you can. I mean, the the customer may request particular lifecycle management uh, uh, events or alter the lifecycle management uh, policies for the uh, for the VNFs that have been described, and that implies, among other things, that the customer is aware of which are the individual 
network functions, not in the other cases, because we are talking at the, at the service layer. And finally, a, a full control or almost close to full control implies that uh, the, there is a direct control of the infrastructure itself, of the infrastructure that has been allocated to that slice, not of the full infrastructure for sure, but of the infrastructure that has been uh, allocated to the, uh, to the slice, including um, cloud operations and including some degree of ICM control. Finally, what is important for all of these is that uh, for sure, what we, are re what we have here is the exposure of a very uh, critical and uh, shared uh, infrastructure to uh, multiple tenants in the future, uh, uh, several verticals. We will be doing some action in both, in, both, uh, I mean, in both directions, in consuming data, consuming data that can disclose uh, things that are very sensitive in terms of privacy or, or, or commercial uh, protection. And on the other hand, somehow uh, requesting some actions that may affect the, 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 the infrastructure. This is on the one hand, on the other hand as well. I mean, it's a, it is something that is uh, conceivable that some actions from the side of the operator could negatively affect the internal NPN and cause some disruption as well in the normal operations of the customer. So for, for this, I mean, it's, uh, for sure you cannot avoid errors, you cannot avoid accidents, but what is important is to increase the security is to have proper authentication, proper authorization, what is even important, more important, well, it's a, it's a natural consequence of the, of the first two A's, is the third A that is about the counting. So you are completely, uh, you, you can trace back who asked for what and at the moment, and so you can trace back um, the, uh, um, the path that uh, caused a particular um, problem. This is important because of two reasons. One is that because that way you can learn for the future to avoid these situations. And second, because as well is important, we're talking about commercial relationships uh, and we're talking about commercial relationships of, on very valuable uh, assets. And it's important as well in the case of a, of a failure, of a serious failure, of a serious SLA violation of a contract that nothing needs to be renegotiated it's good to have evidence in one sense or the other because commercial indemnities, et cetera, is, uh, are very are key for the, for the whole thing uh, to work. The idea and we would propose is a, is a token-based mechanism in which what you have is that uh, the way in which uh, with the proper identity, you get uh, a different token that entitles the, uh, the requester of a certain operation uh, to, a, a set of, to a certain level and that is associated inevitably to the, uh, uh, to the identity of the request. Uh, well, that's all the other properties that you can imagine about non-repudiation uh, non and about non-reproducibility, et cetera. And the idea is to, to keep a, a register of all these operations based on this identity that are very much uh, tailored to, to the particular um, tenant or, or individual that is behind it and to use, and this is something that we are evaluating as well, to use uh, mechanisms that allow even for, for independent third party verification, like, as you can imagine, and I will, I will say the word blockchains uh, behind this to, to, to allow for this. Just to finish, uh, the, uh, uh, this is, I mean, with, with this, the, these are the model in which we are basing what we're doing. We are taking the, our first steps on here. We are, we are um, the ideas to that the pilots and the use cases that were presented before by Simone and Jesus will be evaluated in such an environment. We are working on it and we have identified several challenges that uh, we have ahead when it comes to, uh, to precisely uh, uh, progress in the integration for management and orchestration. Right now, some of the, uh, of the technical, uh, technological domains are a little bit, I mean, the, the mechanisms for man managing them is a, uh, a little bit disjoint and it is to go into a full network programmability with a, with a consistent model. Accountability is essential, as I said before, and uh, for, for maintaining a, a proper and healthy commercial relationships. And uh, it's, it's essential that we have means for assurance and SLA verification that can be run by third independent parties and would simplify very much uh, further litigation and, and uh, misunderstandings. Uh, it would be quite interesting to, to I mean, and, and, and to think and it's about uh, AI and analytics, etc., to to uh, work with uh, predictive orchestration in both sides. And, and think about that we're talking about precisely uh, 
facilitating uh, access to, to data. How we uh, express these uh, requirements, how we uh, express their requests, how we express even, even the request for, for data access or for some actions doesn't, on the, on the side of the customer, doesn't need to go very deep in the, uh, in the infrastructure, among other things, because it should not go, about, we're talking about abstraction, so we have to improve our interfaces. And for sure, it's, a, it's about the idea that in the future we will have uh, as uh, many closed loops as possible and as, uh, and, and as closed as possible. And this uh, requires data models that are consistent and on the other hand as well, action models that are consistent and are portable and not depending on a, on a, single, uh, um, uh, a single implementation or a single uh, provider of the infrastructure. And with this, I have and it uh, so thank you so much for your attention and happy to address any questions you may have thank you very much diego so any questions so please if you have any questions uh write uh, those into the chat and meanwhile i will ask to to all the speakers that are gonna be part of the of the panel to to prepare and turn on the the video and the and the microphone so because now we are going to have a panel discussion on basically on the topic of uh, npn non-public networks and public networks integration focusing on on, on the use case of uh, 5g for for industry 4.0 and in this uh, panel session we are going to have uh, the presenters the previous presenters so simone jesus and diego plus uh, manuel lorenzo from ericsson and also cd from nec that she will be the next presenter after the panel. So if there are no questions, maybe we can directly go into, into the panel. I think we are- Carlos, uh, uh, should I stop sharing my screen? Yes, or... yes, please. Or if yes. you're happy with the logos, I'm, <laughs> I'm always happy with the logos of my group, but uh, I, I think we, okay. can, we can stop sharing and then we can see our faces, I think. Uh, I'll stop, okay. So uh, if there are no, no questions, then we can start with the, with the panel. And I, I would like to start the panel with, uh, by asking each of you guys to basically in two, three minutes, provide a, a quick uh, introductory opinion on, on, on the topic. What, how do you see this NPN, PN integration? Why do you think about it in terms of, uh, of how far we are from that? What is the value? Basically something to trigger the discussion and then we can take it from, from there. So maybe we can, we can start with uh, Manuel, if Manuel is in the line. Uh, Manuel, can you hear us? Hello, Carlos. Can you hear me too? Yeah, hi, Manuel. So Very good. Please go ahead. Glad, yes, glad to be here. Uh, well, I would like to, to start with a few reflections and, uh, and considerations for discussion, if okay to you. Uh, I mean, the very first thing is that um, this is a core discussion. At the same time, it uh, there's rich possibilities, uh, uh, a huge uh, range of opportunities to explore. Uh, when uh, companies like our partners, our vertical partners in this industry product zero domain, uh, are considering their technology uh, operations and their business uh, demands, uh, then we have used in five growth uh, project uh, the ACIA model to a little bit verify what is the closest um, approach that can work for them. Because this is the, the essential part of it all, that we can think what works and if the immediate, ex, the immediate step would be to validate and validate over, over a real setup. The, this is, the, to me, the differential aspect of five growth project, that it's going far way beyond the theory into practical validation in labs of these models. That is a very first reflection that whatever we try, uh, it's super important that we verify uh, that it works. We learn from what doesn't work and rethink and uh, start the cycle again as many times as possible because we are in the innovation cycle, cycle. We are in the moment that we can do this so that we prevent risks for, for the future uh, business. A second reflection is that uh, this is a discussion that affects a wide range of use cases for these companies, for uh, 
for their use cases, for their different premises, for their mm, suppliers, for the way they connect to customers, and so on. So it's extremely likely that there will be different models. If again we take this ACI a model, it's very difficult, very very possible that there's different deployment models that have to live together for the same company, and and that requires uh, developing uh, knowledge and it skills on 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 these companies and on the ICT sector because we have to learn how to serve better those needs understanding the full context of it and and i think this is important because otherwise we can uh, keep on creating silos of uh, ot it iot and cloud and the whole point with 5g is that we can remove all those barriers and we can create a continuum of solutions that really serves the needs of uh, of the, the industrial customers so those are my first reflection on, on this uh, discussion maybe a little bit at a higher level than what was discussed it was a great presentation by by Diego, and uh, a fantastic opening by our colleagues in the vertical domains. But I think that sometimes we have to step a little bit back and think on the on the full picture for it. And this is one of those topics where we need this type of discussion and actual uh, validation activities in the project. Okay, thank you very much, Manuel. Thank you very much. So then maybe we can we can switch to our vertical colleagues, so Simone and then Jesus. Yeah, um, from I, I would say that what what is more important for us uh, in some ways uh, the technical point of view and unfortunately as well the the costs and so from uh, non-public network and public network uh, nowadays just to give you the actual feeling about what we have we have actually uh, a rack with I think four four servers two basebands since. Uh, we, are, we have an SNA uh, deployment of 5G. So we have many hardware and software that has to be keep maintained and so on. And so to be completely honest, we are not actually, we don't have the competencies to, to deal with that. And so for, for, from our point of view, uh, nowadays we have strict on the having that since we, since requirements that we have from use cases, but in the future could be really valuable to have all these things outside, completely outside from the plant and just define an SLA uh, about how and, uh, and how much we have to pay for, for that services. Uh, having uh, a public network as well could be really, really useful. Uh, just thinking about uh, uh, having, let's say, thanks to slicing, a common perimeter and absolutely private perimeter uh, all over the world, all over the Kumau plants, and just think about uh, how many uh, use cases we can uh, we can create on top of this network, on this system, just relying on the performance and security as well of the 5G. Uh, security, to be completely honest, is one of the biggest constraints that nowadays we have in handling these kind of things. And so from that point of view, I, can, I think it could be really valuable. Okay, thank you, Simone. So, Jesus? Hi. Hi. Um, from my point of view, from our point of view, as Simone said, one of the main uh, key clues is that we don't, uh, we don't have the expertise, so we need uh, people from the operators and from the telecommunications world to to help us to, to, to reach there on one side. On the other side, in our case, in particular case of Innovalia, we, 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 it doesn't depend that much on us, but on our customers that they have a, a 5G access, 5G, 5G network in their, in their premises. So we are very interested in, in promoting and, and yeah, among the, our customers to, to, to go there, to get there, but um, yeah, but it doesn't, it's not, it makes no sense for us to, to make a big deployment if our customer, they don't have it also, because we need to connect to them in the case of the remote operation and also in the case of, of other in, uh, future services like interoperability, uh, intercommunication, uh, sorry, collaboration between machine between machines and whatever, an automatization of the, of the, 
of the quality process. And that is only possible if if we have the 5G infrastructure there. And usually what we find is that our customers, they say, we don't know about that. So we need someone to, to help us to, to get there. Of course, security is also, is also fundamental for, for in the industrial uh, sector article. Um, but yeah, I think it has a great potential and, and there are many, many, many possibilities and we will get there, but the thing is how and, and, and when. Okay, thank you, Jesus. Uh, Diego? Well, uh, I, I, I would like to, to make a, a three, three remarks or four, if you allow me. F first is the first one is about precisely the relevance and, and Simone and Jesus have been talking about this. Uh, the, the importance of, uh, of abstraction, the idea is that you, you don't need to be an expert on, on, on the details, on the gory details of networking to, uh, to use it. And the idea is that the network should be really programmable and really usable because otherwise, at the end, is something that I heard uh, some time ago, is that the only important thing in IoT is how you connect to the cloud. The problem of this is that the, the, the cloud is not or should not be able to address all the use cases in terms of latency, etc. And what is important as well is that the cloud is something that is owned by, uh, by, by third parties that are not precisely interested because it's against their, 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 their business model in open, openness and uh, inter, interworking, etc. What they try to, to, contact, to control everything and in some cases or in many cases um, the, uh, the, uh, the full dependence on one single provider is not precisely the best strategy. This is one thing. Second thing is, uh, is precisely about the, the relevance of security, auditability, and let me say third party, this, uh, this possibility of having independent third parties uh, making check-ins, et cetera, to warranty, again, um, to warranty openness, to warranty uh, interoperability, to warranty as well the, uh, um, uh, the preservation of things that are quite important, like uh, privacy or, or confidentiality. And third is something that Manuel uh, mentioned, and I think is, uh, he's very right, and the need that we are talking about very sensitive environments. We're talking about industrial environments, we're talking about uh, the critical uh, infrastructure, we're talking about things to which you have to be very careful about the experiments and, the, and how you do it. Normally, the, the, our industry and others have been accused of being extremely conservative and being even a little bit uh, uh, not precisely brave in introducing new technologies and addressing this. But, but this is because, among other things, we have a very wide and relevant install base, and it's very dangerous to make radical changes when it's difficult to, to roll back because you have to, to make it in a, in a wide, very wide or very, or, or very uh, deep basis. So having uh, places like the uh, like what the five growth is uh, is uh, places and, and, and running experiments that have showed you the impact for for good or for bad of what of the uh, of the uh, approaches they are proposing and uh, that uh, allows you to seriously and that, that seriously is very important verify the implications of what you're doing and how you can uh, uh, how you can uh, uh, re the, uh, the, uh, the goals you had is something that is uh, extremely important and very relevant. And I think this is one of the main uh, uh, results that we can expect from, from the project. Okay, thank you, Diego. And last introductory speech from, from C. Hi, good morning. So, um, definitely the uh, deployment of a private network or non-private network would be uh, quite desired by the different verticals, uh, as mentioned also by the other speakers. Um, in actually in 5G growth, we are also uh, following uh, 5G ACIA kind of uh, as 3JP defined the deployment scenario to investigate for different pillar, what kind of deployment uh, will make sense for them. Uh, in my opinion, so I think the main challenges uh, are not only about how to provide technical solutions. For example, uh, we can leave it on our slicing solution or sharing of run or transport to enable this different deployment scenario. But one most important question is actually what will be the right model to use? What will be the right deployment scenario for each of the vertical uh, use cases? So in my opinion, we 
uh, purely vertical use case dependent, uh, we cannot we could not generalize it. So it depends firstly on several like uh, key attributes already mentioned, like security, um, quality service guarantee, how to access the operation management, and but also about the device connectivity. So for example, in, in Ovalia kind of uh, vertical pillar, they may also need to connect devices in the other location or their customer, which are different places. And also how you provide the global connectivity of the services and synergies of service uh, performance, and sure also the cost. So basically, uh, the more you would like to share with the public network, the lower the cost, but then the penalty will be you will lose the security privacy um, guarantee, also the perf performance of the quality service. So at the end, I think uh, it is need a very careful study uh, from the different the verticals, as well with the support of the operators to analyze all of, the, all of this attribute and the, the gain about what will be the most critical for the business of the different uh, vertical sectors. And then based on that, to make a decision about the right deployment scenario and then uh, once the deployment scenario is clear, then we can talk about the technical solutions. So this is my opinion. Okay, thank you very much. So I, I think that those are all very good points and, and just to foster a bit uh, more discussion, I, I have two, two things I wanted to put on the table and then I guess it's best that uh, any of you guys that want to, to intervene just, just uh, start uh, uh, talking. So I have to two main reflections. One is related to what I think Diego and Manuel touched upon before that are on, on what 5G can do for the industry. So I think one of the key points is that my opinion, maybe at the beginning now things are changing, but is that uh, some in industries or uh, verticals uh, were not very much aware of what 5G can bring. What are the advantages? And it's a uh, in some cases, a very close environment, as Diego mentioned. So I want to ask you from, from your different perspective, we have here uh, operators, we have verticals, we have vendors. What do you think, how do you think this has changed in, in the sense of uh, how verticals are aware now what 5G could bring? And how do you think this is evolving since we started working on, on 5G some years ago, and, and now that we are more into the actual evaluation and learning process with real, real pilots. So any of you has any opinion on this? Yeah, actually, I, I agree with, uh, with Diego. Uh, I'm, I'm just 26, and so when I started working on manufacturing, actually, there's these kind of old-fashioned design of everything let's say and so uh, of course uh, th this kind of choice apart from jerking uh, is driven by the fact that everything has to be really reliable and and so when you have such an amount of data in, in, in case of uh, downtime of, of production of course you, you can't really uh, make every every time changes and so on uh, and so this is probably one of the main uh, constraints in the uh, wide, let's say, use of 5G, but in general, completely different technologies in the actual plant. And uh, on, the other, on the other hand, the other, I think, uh, biggest stone that we have in the middle of our part in the 5G in manufacturing is about, uh, let's say, uh, costs. In fact, uh, uh, it, it's, it, it could be really tricky to uh, go to, I don't know, the, the, the giant car manufacturer like Mercedes or BMW, BMW uh, which are our customer, and convince them to substitute cables uh, in favor of 5G or just use 5G and so install all the antennas and so on for just, I don't know, two or three use cases that they have new. So uh, what, what we uh, as, let's say, 5G uh, <laughs> discovers, let's say, in manufacturing plant that has to do is, on the one hand, we have to design a solution and use cases that really rely on the 5G performance uh, at natively, uh, natively, let's say. So they are not uh, designed and developed uh, relying on different technologies, but they just rely on the 5G performance. And so that could be really uh, disruptive 
from, from that point of view. And on the other hand, we have to understand uh, well how we can address to manufacturers in general and what could be from the business point of view the best value for them. Nowadays, we all think, or at least I personally think that we have to be oriented on greenfield firstly, but uh, it's something that I will know the opinion also from the others. Hi, this is uh, Shi. May I speak? Sure. Uh, okay. Uh, so, yes, I totally agree with Simon. And uh, in my opinion, uh, that um, you read the people talk about 5G is mainly about low latency, high support. But I think uh, um, when we are doing the gap analysis of the different vertical uh, use cases, we find out so 5G is not only bring the advantage of low latency and support, it provides the high flexibility, availability, reliability, and global connectivity. So these are the main advantage why I see uh, which are possible with 5G, uh, especially for, for example, industry environment, with, which someone just mentioned, Remove, removing the fixed cables with the 5G technology, you are increasing uh, incredibly the flexibility about how to connect devices and uh, also the IoT uh, type of devices. And as well, you, you also uh, uh, reduce the cost by using all the cables. And this flexibility uh, is only possible with uh, wireless. And the other uh, benefit of 5G uh, we also find out is that most of the use cases uh, nowadays by the vertical industry, uh, they are not possible without 5G. So with the 5G, we can, for example, provide high bandwidth to provide a, a 4K video streaming which is not possible before. And it's also not possible with uh, 3G and 4G uh, kind of connectivity. So this also bring the new business uh, and services by the vertical. And the last point is that um, a lot of the current vertical um, uh, industry use case, they may deploy heterogeneous communications uh, mixing of Wi-Fi, 3G, 4G kind of communication for different application needs. So 5G will provide a unified kind of communication to fulfill all different uh, application needs for their communication. And uh, on the one hand, you can provide with the slicing capability, you can provide uh, ultra low latency for low latency application. At the same time, you can provide the mobile broadband slice to enhance the video or high bandwidth applications. Uh, so this is the ability which we can see from the 5G. So that's uh, from my side. Thank you, Chi. I, uh, if I may speak, I agree with, with um, Simone that one of the barriers is that uh, use cases are, are relatively small and we, if you, we, we need a, a Big investment to 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 provide 5G connectivity on on factories and, and everything. We need something else than just a few use cases and and everything. But, but also, I would like to, to to focus as as our clients customers are more mainly SMEs. Uh, yeah, I think it's great to 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 focus on on Mercedes or or any other uh, big companies, but most of the companies in Europe are SMEs and there they don't have the, 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 the capacity to invest that much in, 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 in a big deployment of, of 5G networks. That's why I think it is important to, to, to potentiate the, the, also the public connectivity. For instance, in Spain, there are not that much uh, areas with 5G and also, and most of them are in the cities, not in the in the industrial areas, of course, because uh, for the operators it's more more uh, profitable for now uh, to 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 go there. But that's also for for me and uh, a point that it's important. The infrastructure has to grow a lot, so until SMEs especially can 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 get there. Okay, thank you, Jesus. Uh, just for the allusions on the, uh, on the infrastructure and all the like, um, well, 5G is going, I mean, my, my impression, that's a personal impression, that's a 
corporate uh, uh, statement. But 5G is going, is going uh, slower than originally planned, basically because, I mean, we still lack the killer application. I mean, video was uh, for 4G, SMS and the, uh, and the general interaction on, the, uh, on different platforms was for 3G, etc. So we, we, we are looking for it. Uh, and, and I can assure you, Jesus, is, uh, is that if there are clear demands on the industry for industrial 5G, there will be 5G in the uh, in the industrial areas and no 5G in downtown. I, I can tell you, there is a clear business for that, <laughs> and that, that will be the case. The problem here is about that you have to to create the demand, and to create the demand is precisely about this: is that you have to show it, and this is what we are trying to do. Is, uh, is that is trying to go beyond the typical impressive uh, demos that are so typical. I mean, you go to the UCNC in the last uh, physical UCNC in Valencia, we saw a couple of very impressive demos on the, on the harbor and uh, with the holograms and all the like. And it's about showing something that is, uh, can be shown, can be backed by data, etc. And this is what we're trying to do precisely. It's, uh, and it's true. I mean, you, people you can show them. Then look, look, a rescue on the on the sea with drones, etc. Looks very, very exciting. But then you say, no, no. Well, but you, you know, I'm selling, I'm selling. I don't know, frozen fish. I'm bringing salmon from Norway or Scotland, and I'm slicing it and selling it. This is nothing to do with me. Then you have to show, no, no. But look, you can manage the freezers in a way that is, or you can manage or analyze the status of the fish you have inside with your cameras, et cetera, in a way that is not, uh, is, is unprecedented. And it's cheap and is, uh, is something that can, you can abstract and not be, you're, you're not required to be an expert in the network. This is something that, we, that is what we have to show, I believe, in order to create the demand. So uh, all in all, we are dealing with the technology. We will create the, uh, the idea is to create the tools for the guys that are, that are able to sell the product, go around and say, well, look how it works. But, but we had to, to give them the, the tools. I don't know if I can, but Diego, I actually, I really see your point, but uh, I think that something more uh, is missing. For, let, let's make an example, really. Uh, I, I told before uh, about PLCs. And okay, 5G could be the bad over, could be the connection over everything uh, go up and through. And all the communication we can think about uh, moving through 5G. But as a, as a or sometimes as a, I, I said also to you all, uh, for example, we are, we, we are really, uh, we, we can't find, uh, devices in terms of CPE, in terms of gateway, which are actually designed for the industrial scenarios. And so, for example, I have a really expensive and, and huge Nokia CPE, but uh, it cuts the MTU at uh, uh, 1000 and half. And so it, it's not feasible for my communication, my kind of communication. And with Team Ericsson, whoever else, we are struggling to find something, also a prototype, whatever you want, but there's nothing. And so what, what I will try to say is that, uh, okay, uh, obviously we are like, uh, the entire pipeline that is required to really uh, get 5G to fly, we are just you at one end and us and the other hand. But if we don't have all the other pieces in the middle, actually, I think, uh, that it's not it's not feasible to develop a killer application, but I, I absolutely agree with you. Uh, j j just a note, Simone, we are suffering. We have the, we share the suffering on the uh, on the availability of devices and all the like. Uh, but this is another story. We can enter in the dynamics of the industry and how we have uh, th th this industry by nature has a, has a tend to to have very big companies and those big companies are difficult to move. All of them. No, not only not only operators, not only vendors. All of us are difficult. We have been more than one century around, so it's, things are complicated. We have to learn because either, either we we change or we we will disappear like the dinosaurs. But that's another story. Carlos, this is Manuel Lorenzo. Can I still add something to this nice discussion? Yeah, of course. Uh, uh, first of all, of course, the the level of awareness of uh, of the, the innovation ecosystem around 5G is huge now. Uh, uh, five years ago, when, when I mean, co at corporate level, in, in the discussion we have at Ericsson with our uh, communication service providers and verticals, uh, 
it was like two one-way communications. Uh, we disclosed what we do, what we were doing to other parties, and, and vice versa. Uh, it, it was not so easy to find the, you know, the sweet spot to uh, really starting to cooperate. And now it's so different. We are doing things every day together. We are talking the same language. Uh, we share the same objectives. Uh, it's it's amazing how this has evolved and. Uh, Leo was commenting on the speed of adoption of 5G. To me, this is the, the most important aspect of adoption that, that we are really innovating together. And, and projects like 5 Growth really work into, into this goal. Uh, that said, I think that uh, uh, one thing is uh, companies, uh, concrete companies, another thing is the industry ecosystems. This has been uh, commented by Jesus and Simone and several times, it's super important. The role that these companies manufacturing and creating tools for all the manufacturers is essential to, to create a spread of, uh, of the technology. They are pioneers and they, they are uh, key players in, in moving their customers ahead, in satisfying their needs and uh, with this uh, balance of operations and innovation. Uh, the more these companies are involved in the in the adoption of 5G, the better for for the whole ecosystem. And uh, about the devices issue, mm, okay, let's benefit from the experience of uh, having having had this problem for all the generations of mobile, and finally getting to a point where there is a, a wide uh, range of suppliers and solutions for it. We are at the moment that it it, it poses something like a risk. But if we trust uh, the trajectory of our industry, it will be pretty much solved uh, soon. Also, because our industry works a lot in, in standards and open access to, um, I mean, anyone can create a company to manufacture devices because uh, it's the way we work. We, we are uh, obliged and happily uh, share all the IPR and technology for enabling that those companies can create solutions. So uh, that we should be optimistic, even if worried for the for the short term. I agree with Simone, but uh, we have learned from the past that it's a typical wave when there's so many actors involved in, in moving the technology forward. So that was my comment on this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Manuel. So uh, I, I want to uh, bring another another question that uh, actually you said put in into the chat. Um, that is uh, regarding the, the models, deployment models that um, you see guys are more suitable in terms of the NPN, PN uh, integration. So do you have any, any feedback on, on what you see as of today as the more suitable models for your, for your use cases and, and, and why you think so? Can you bring some, some ideas or some feedback on, on this? Hi, this is she. Can I start with this question? Uh, so, yeah, it's a very good question. And actually, I mean, there's no, like, uh, as I mentioned, no general uh, rule, but sure, there are guidelines. So even in the 5G ACI white paper, they also uh, mention what would be the main um, attribute you need to consider and to do the analysis. So as I mentioned, so uh, the, there are the exchange, either you go to completely isolated uh, private network or you are leveraging on the public network completely. So, and then something in between. So depending, I think it's depending uh, firstly about the cost, which is the critical factor. So as the, the more sharing you were like to go to more using the public network, the lower the cost. And then on the other hand is, oh, it's your service needs. So also like if you were like to, you, 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 if the, uh, the application need the connectivity across different locations, this would definitely need the public network to be involved and with it's difficult to deploy a dedicated 5G network just to uh, connect different locations, even across uh, countries. And then the, uh, also how you write um, the uh, security is also very major uh, consideration, also mentioned by Simone and others. So the security will be the major uh, aspect to be considered by the verticals. So this will be a trade-off uh, among all these three factors. And, and then how will be the right one to choose? 
uh, is really depending on the desired uh, performance of this attribute by the, the different uh, use cases. Carlos, this is, this is Manuel. I, I would like to comment uh, may, maybe more from experience than from uh, you know, prediction of things. Uh, the model that we are working more uh, and from quite a long time is the the, the third model of the 5G ACIA uh, reference model, uh, where there is a the deployment of a uh, there is a shared run and control plane, uh, still with the with the factories using uh, that connectivity as if it were uh, for themselves through slicing. It goes very well with edge computing. It goes very well with the limitation and constraints. And it's uh, rather easy to put in practice, which is super important. It doesn't require that the companies have to change their uh, set of skills uh, from one you know, overnight, or uh, that operators uh, have to think of a, a radical new model. Of course, there's a number of things to put together, but it's like a, an anchor model to me from which you can evolve more to pure public. Uh, as uh, Innovale was saying, uh, their customers are SME, and they have to benefit as much as possible of uh, public infrastructure. But there's also the high-end customers who would go a little bit to the left, having more and more control on the infrastructure for their operations. So to me, I would uh, that would be something like a starting point uh, that really goes very well with the uh, with the strong assets that each of the parties has, and uh, beyond being feasible for the use cases, which it is, uh, it's suitable for the for the set of skills that each company has from the beginning. Uh, I, I would like to add one thing, if I, if I, we have time still, uh, is simply <clears throat> five more minutes. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so. The idea is that um, my, my, my idea is that we need to think a little bit out of the box. I mean, when we're talking about deployment models, etc., we tend to think. I mean, this is something that has been the common denominator in the uh, in the in the telecommunications in in, in the the approach that once one size fits all or almost all. Precisely what we are trying to do with all these um, spatial levels, programmability, abstractions, etc., is that you that we would become able to have several deployment models with a single infrastructure. And this is, this is quite important and it is a, a real challenge. I mean, so building an infrastructure that is flexible enough to accommodate all those different uh, deployment models. And again, it's important that we have infrastructures like, uh, like Phytonic and, uh, and pro projects like Phygro that allow us precisely to experiment it before you ask operators to deploy, um, and manufacturers to, to provide, and customers to consume this kind of, uh, of new infrastructure, new paradigms, because then we will be able to do it in a, in a sound basis. And that's it, it's a general okay. uh, comment. So a, a, any more uh, comments on, on this question from, about the models from many of you guys? I see a question on the chat. Ah, well, yeah. but it's, uh, it's uh, no, but it's only sent to me. So, <laughs> and yeah, uh, it's about uh, we are still. I mean, can you see it? No, uh, I, I can. I can see it as well. So, but uh, yeah, please go ahead. Take the take the, take the question. Oof. I I think I think in my view, uh, currently. Uh, uh, Diego, Diego, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I can see it, but I don't know about the rest. So maybe you can just. Oh. Say the ah, question. yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yes. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. I, for example, I can't see that. Okay, just in case the, the, the I mean the uh, the, the, the um, common mortals cannot <laughs> see it. <laughs> the, the, those who are not the speakers or whatever. It's, now, well, the, the question is about uh, which could be the vertical that would uh, that could help in drive these at the beginning, uh, whether healthcare, industry for zero, others. Personally, I believe that the industry is uh, is the, uh, I mean, industry in general. We're not talking about because when you say industry, you see big manufacturing plants and the one Simone was showing or the, the robots, the cars, etc. Think about that, for example, there are many important industries that we don't tend to think in terms of, uh, of when you think about industry, we don't tend, tend to think about, for example, the food industry that is extremely important. Uh, we don't tend to think about agriculture itself can be industrialized as well. 
Um, so I think I think that there is a, an enormous field there, and is the, probably is the one that currently is has been, for good reasons, has been uh, somehow isolated from public networks, etc. Isolated in the sense that there was a very clear demarcation point. This is the the industry. This is the network. We have a, our own network here. I believe that industry is, uh, is the most suitable for, for driving this uh, evolution. And let me say, industry in the, in the uh, wider sense possible. I, just, just to add a few words, I absolutely agree with, with Diego again. I think that uh, just thinking about agriculture, uh, just not thinking about what we could have today, but if you just think on tomorrow, if you think about uh, automizing uh many different tasks for i don't know grasping or something like that uh, actually in case of you can't have everything on let's say i, I just just resume myself so if you are in the agricultural point of view uh you can think about uh, automating uh, something like uh, tomato grasping or something like that uh, since there's a really ethereal process and conditions it's really difficult to think about a solution that has all the computational power needed uh, to be close to the tomato. And so uh, it, it's really common to think about like, let's say a cloud or a server close to the tomato, but not really there. And so we, are, we, are, we have to find a way to create in the middle between the server and the, the robot close to the, to the tomato something that is of course uh, with the high performance since you are controlling a robot you are controlling the uh, autonomous guided vehicle that uh, uh, has has brought the robot to close to the tomato you have to uh, in real time control many things and you have no network there since wi-fi in completely open field i think it's 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 a bit complicated so thank you diego for that example Thank you guys. So I think we are basically in sync with the with the agenda. So I think we can close it here, the very interesting discussion on the panel. Thank you guys for, for participating. And then we can move on to the, the next uh, presentation, which is uh, from Chile, Senate Research uh, in, in NEC, that uh, she's going to talk about the five growth innovations for automating the vertical service uh, deployment and lifecycle management over 5G. So Chi, please, if you can uh, Okay, I see that I see your screen now. So please uh, go ahead. We cannot hear you. Too. I don't oh, know. Oh, sorry, <laughs> I forgot to unmute myself. I hope you can hear me now. Yes. Okay. Uh, so I um, today I'm going to uh, uh, give a talk uh, about the five G growth uh, concept and the uh, architecture solutions and the key innovations we are developing in the project uh, to build a private 5G network for the different verticals to help them to automate in the vertical service deployment and managing the life cycles over the 5G infrastructure. Uh, the talk will consist of three parts. I will start with an overview about the project uh, vision um, and what kind of vertical pilot we are focusing on in the project. And then uh, afterwards, I will present the baseline architecture and our extensions uh, we are considering for uh, supporting the different vertical uh, pilots. Uh, at last, I will present you a summary of the innovations we are developing and also give you some examples. So our the vision of the 5G, pro, uh, 5G growth project is to empower the vertical industries with the focusing on the industry 4.0 uh, transportation and energy sectors to provide with an AI-driven automated and shareable 5G end-to-end -end solution. Uh, towards this vision, uh, we are aiming to automate in the process of service creation and onboarding process, also to build and managing the respected uh, vertical services and never slices uh, for the different verticals. And also we like to enhance the vertical support by allowing the vertical to manage and monitor their services and also configure the applications. So this will be done through a, a vertical portal, which we call the vertical slicer, which are interfacing directly with the different verticals with the 5G end-to-end -end platform. 
Uh, secondly, we are also aiming to uh, enhance uh, the closed loop automation and SLA control to uh, managing the life cycle of the vertical services and to ensure the service uh, guarantee. Uh, finally, we are also working on the direction of AI-driven end-to-end network solutions in order to jointly optimizing the different heterogeneous resources across uh, run, transfer, cloud, um, according to different uh, domains as well as the different technologies. So all this will be uh, the innovation of the vision. We are envisioning the project will, will be developing on top of 5G growth platform, which will be a software-based open source platform. Um, and this we are actually leveraging on the transformer uh, platform we developed uh, in the phase two project. And uh, another um, important point is that uh, this platform is not only to managing the resources of the vertical sites in their premises, but also to enable them to connect to the uh, public network in our project uh, will be meaning the ICT-17 uh, 5G end-to-end -end platform, namely the 5G EVE and 5G Vini. So with that, uh, we are able to uh, execute the few trials to perform the technical and business validation for the 5G technologies for all the different vertical um, use cases. Uh, in the project, we are aiming for four different uh, pilots. Four different pilots uh, across uh, Portugal, Spain, and Italy, and two of them are focusing on Industry 4.0, as you already uh, heard the presentation uh, from Innovalia and Kamal. And then there will be another one on the energy uh, sector um, and one for the transportation, and both of them are coming from Portugal. So all these four, four different vertical promises uh, will be um, few child and that means we need to develop um, the, the technology and innovation to do the uh, validation and testing of all the pre-commercial 5G technology of radio transferring code for the dif these four different pilots and they will be connected via the uh, 5G end-to-end -end platform of 5G EVE and 5G Vini. Before I'm going to present the uh, concept and the uh, high level view of the baseline architecture uh, in the project. Before that, I would like to firstly introduce the main building blocks uh, we are having. Uh, it consists of uh, three main uh, building bl blocks, um, also uh, mainly three layers. From top down, uh, the most top layer is the uh, actually a vertical portal, which we call the vertical slicer. It acts as a single entry point for all the verticals to request uh, their services and build the narrow slice. And it is responsible for uh, mapping all the vertical services onto narrow slice, which uh, we are realizing through the network services defined by the AMV. I also uh, need to manage the life cycles um, of the vertical services and respected narrow slices. Second layer is the service trader layer, which is mainly to do the end-to-end uh, -end orchestration of the network services with the focus on the service and resource orchestration by uh, to deciding where to place function and how much resource need to be allocated for deploying the network services. And in addition, you also need to manage the life cycle as well as the SLAs of the network services. The bottom layer is uh, the resource layer. It is responsible for managing uh, the underlying physical or virtual infrastructure, uh, including transport, RAM, Mac, and cloud uh, domains in order to deploy the network services requested by the, the service data layer. And besides, it also provides a unified view of the uh, underlying network to the upper layer with a proper abstraction and also enabling the configuration of heterogeneous resources via different kind of plugins. Uh, on the right hand side, you can see uh, the basically the workflow through the whole system. So we starting with a vertical, which request a vertical services to the uh, 5G growth platform. If you, uh, uh, our service request will be sent by our filling out our vertical service blueprint on the nosebam of the uh, uh, platform. 
And then the vertical will fill out the vertical service grouping with the additional parameter for the vertical services. And this will be translated in a vertical slicer layer to a vertical service descriptor. And then this uh, will be mapped the network slice, which will be deployed as AMV network services. In that case, the vertical service descriptor will be translated and mapped to a network service descriptor. And this will be sent to the storage data layer. So a data layer is mainly to uh, manage and orchestrating the network services requested by the vertical slicer to deploy the network slice. As I said, the so data uh, will decide uh, according to the network service descriptor about where to place the uh, functions and what resources they need from the um, abstracted um, um, abstraction from the provided by the lower layer. And then basically it will send a request the resource layer to, for the resource allocation and also uh, requesting the installation of the services on the uh, underlying layer, networks. And essentially the resource layer is actually uh, getting this request and do the actual mapping of a logical network which is requested by the solicitor uh, layer for the network slicing onto the shared inf uh, physical infrastructure. So this is basically uh, the main idea about how we deploy um, a services requested by the vertical through the system and, and map it uh, from the high level business requirement to the network slice requirement and then to redeploy it in the underlying infrastructure. According to this workflow and the uh, main building blocks, so we are taking on the uh, transformer uh, reference architecture as our baseline architecture. So this uh, slide shows you the main um, entities which will be presented in each of the layer uh, and the building blocks and also showing the required interfaces. Uh, and they are pretty much aligned with the uh, uh, SC and CPP uh, kind of uh, architecture view. And uh, one more thing I would like to highlight is that we also allow the federation across different administrative domains, especially if you, if the service will be deployed in different locations or and then it will be um, managed by a different operator. And this is a uh, business uh, case we are enabling through the federation to enable um, uh, especially through the data layer, enable the network service federation. And uh, in the context of 5G course, uh, we are actually extending this baseline architecture uh, in order to enable more innovations uh, to support the uh, vertical uh, pilot use cases. So basically the extension consists of two more building blocks. Firstly, is we are developing uh, one AI machine learning platform to empower the AI for the uh, platform capability to managing the services. So this platform basically uh, will provide a catalog of AI machine learning models um, to help uh, the 5G growth uh, different layers to make uh, a based uh, smarter decisions. And uh, also uh, uh, provide the process to uh, chain and tune these AI models uh, with the help of our monitoring uh, platform. And this uh, monitoring platform, which is also leveraging on the 5G transformer monitoring platform, which uh, on the one hand provides the monitoring data and contact information for the 5G growth system in order to uh, uh, enhance also to make closed loop management decisions. On the other hand, it also provides the contest information and also the performance metrics uh, for the AI machine learning platform to help them to chain the model and also to compute the reward uh, for the changing process. In addition, that, uh, in addition to these two building blocks, we are also extending the concept of federation. So especially for the context of the integration of public network and non-public networks, we are also uh, extending the federation uh, beyond the service data layer, which are already uh, leveraging from transformer project solutions. And we are also developing the solution for the vertical service level uh, federation, meaning that we can uh, request a federation of uh, a sub 
vertical services or another uh, uh, slice from another administrative domain by uh, from a provider or operators. So with uh, this uh, consideration, uh, we are building as well the innovation on top of this extended architecture. So in the following, I will introduce you uh, the innovations we are developing. So firstly, uh, we analyzing what is the uh, current capability of the platform we are living on from Crunch Transformer. And then we're analyzing the requirements and the needs of the different vertical patterns. So then we identify a list of gaps about the feature and functionality we are still missing and we need to develop and fill this gap in order to support the different vertical uh, pilots. So uh, this list consists of, we need to uh, support next generation RAM in order to meet the target 5G requirement. And we also need a zero touch solution, which is based on AI to enhance uh, the life cycle management of vertical service to, to improve the service automation process. And we need the solution for closed loop management as our control in order to ensure the service performance all the time and to adapt to any changes on the infrastructure layer as well as on the service layer. I also mentioned to enable the integration of uh, PN and non public network deployment, we need uh, different options for the federation. Uh, this can be happening on the vertical service level, can be also happening on the um, never service level. So we are exploring the different, we need a uh, different solution to enable different options for the integration. And in addition, we also like to en enhance the vertical slice uh, sharing in order to improve the efficiency of sharing the resources and also uh, to enhance the vertical support by providing enhanced monitoring for the vertical services to provide more uh, telemetric monitoring, orchestration of monitoring props, et cetera. And finally, also a very important point is to provide security support. So, uh, and we are leveraging on the 5G transformer platform towards uh, this direction to along with the uh, following um, dimensions. So to have the smartness, increasing the flexibility, efficiency, automation, performance, and security. So in order to do that, uh, we have uh, defined or are developing in total 12 innovations um, on the 5G goals platform, which are cl uh, clustered uh, through framework, architecture, and everything um, uh, categories. So in the following, I'm going to give you uh, three examples. Firstly, is uh, how we uh, are innovation to support the next generation RAM. In this innovation, uh, we are aiming to support the management of RAM segment of never slice in order to guarantee the true end-to-end -end never slicing. Uh, in this innovation, we are, are developing the extension of the 5G uh, growth platform to have additional entities in each of the layer to support the RAM um, uh, slicing. So firstly, on the vertical slicer level, we will have uh, some um, enhancement on the interface information model of the never slicing to allow the vertical to model the RAM requirements. And then in the service data layer, we are mainly uh, focusing on how to provide the run orchestration, including run aware resource placement and allocation. And that's we need uh, additional orchestration functionality uh, to do the uh, uh, run uh, orchestration on top of the abstraction provided by the resource layer. And essentially in the resource layer, uh, we will provide uh, the functionality to, to provide the abstraction of the run domain to the higher layers, also to manage the related uh, physical network function, uh, basically the base station functions, uh, also to allow the enforcement of the RAM configuration uh, through the radio plugins, which will be connected with the RAM controller. In the future, uh, the direction will be also to integrate such a uh, RAM solution to uh, with the ORAM architecture. Uh, one example could be that we are, are looking at a non-real-time radio intelligent controller, um, uh, which could be um, kind of functionality we are developing in the service data layer of the uh, for the resource orchestration, and then for any of the real-time um, 
uh, application and they should be closer to the infrastructure and this should be placed at the radio controller via a prop uh, kind of plugins in the resource layer. So we are trying to develop um, um, the um, application as well as the looking at how to align our interfaces to work this direction to be um, complying with the current ORAM uh, alliance uh, efforts. Another innovation I would like to highlight is the AI. See, okay. uh, we are running a bit behind the agenda time, so if, if you can wrap it up in two, three minutes, that uh, will yeah. be Okay, this will be the uh, last two slides. So the uh, another innovation is uh, AI machine based closed control loop. So this innovation is mainly to provide uh, the closed loop automation for the vertical service life cycle management. And the loop will be consists of uh, collecting monitoring from the monitoring platform for the services resources. And then, uh, then we'll also perform some data analytics to identify what events or to trigger alarm in order to make a uh, certain um, and then there will be at the end there will be the five degrees platform, uh, which are different layers. They will be the ultimate uh, entity to make uh, the operation decision to optimize and reconfigure of the system. And sure, with the help of the AI machine learning platform, which will provide them uh, trained uh, the AI machine learning models uh, for them to make the smarter decisions. So, um, yeah, uh, right now we already have uh, released the first release of the software of the 5G cross platform um, May 2020 this year. And all the uh, uh, current developed innovations, um, some of them I mentioned and some are listed here, uh, they are all available on the uh, link uh, provided by, on the GitHub. So uh, if you are interested, uh, you are very welcome to have a look about our work. And that's uh, all from my side um, on the innovations. Thank you for your attention. Okay. Oh, I finished. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. I was just checking if there was any, any question on the, on the chat. Um, I think there is not uh, so far, so again, if you have questions, please uh, put it on the chat. And meanwhile, we can switch to the next and last um, presentation, which is actually a live demo uh, from uh, Andres Garcia Saavedra, which is also senior researcher at the NEC Laboratories Europe. So Andres, please uh, go ahead and, and start. The floor is yours. We cannot hear you yet. Uh, I think you are muted, Andre. Okay, yeah, sorry, I was muted. Uh, hopefully you can see me well and, and hear me well now. Yeah. Okay, so thanks for the introduction. So yeah, my name is Andres Garcia. I'm also senior researcher at NEC Laboratories Europe. And I'm here essentially to, to, to introduce to you uh, uh, one of the innovations that we are developing within within FIGROAD uh, to sustain uh, some of the vertical use cases that we have in the project. Uh, as, a, as, a, as a technology uh, that tries to improve the way we manage uh, radio, our radio access networks for 5G, but also beyond uh, 5G. So the way I'm going to structure this is uh, I'm going to I'm going to show you first uh, like eight or nine slides uh, to introduce uh, extensively the demo and the technology itself. Right, so you have some context to understand what's going on, and afterwards I will move on uh, to the actual demo, where I will I will present to you a few use cases, a few you know features of the of the prototype that we have built, and um, I'm also available uh, to actually let you play with the with the demo by giving me commands or or whatever you prefer. So this is a live demo, really. So in normal situation, we would be somewhere in a place, and and, and you would be able to actually. Uh, control the dashboard of the demo yourself to see uh, how certain configurations or the impact that certain configurations have on the on the prototype. In this case, I'm I'm happy actually to let you tell me what you would like to see. So uh, regarding the introduction and, and what this is about, so here essentially I'm presenting something that we have uh, coined as Brain. 
uh, Brem stands as AI for, for VRAN, for virtualized radio access networks. And, uh, the, the first question or, or the first point that probably I, I would like to mention is why do we care in 5 growth or in 5G or beyond 5G at all about virtualized runs, right? So, so virtualized radio access network is essentially a, a, a system uh, in which we can centralize uh, softwareized uh, radio access points, 5G not Bs, uh, 4G not Bs, 5G G not Bs, on, on, on whatever comes next, right? And importantly, uh, using a commodity general purpose computing infrastructure, typically placing a bunch of uh, base station stacks, software base station stacks, uh, into a common edge, uh, into a common cloud at the edge. So uh, uh, relatively close to the actual antennas. Uh, of course, this has a lot of advantages, and some of them uh, we already knew them from the times of CRAN and, and, and CloudRAN and, and all, all these things, which is that by centralizing a bunch of, of um, you know, base stations into common infrastructure, we can have uh, statistical multiplexing gains uh, just because we have we can actually pull resources in this case computing resources uh, because they are essentially placed at the same place, and we can you know shift computational capacity towards some base stations when they need it most and, and so on. So we have some advantages and some gains in cost, in operational costs, uh, only from that. But there are more, right? And one of the most important things with virtualization is the fact that now we are handling softwareized base stations, okay? This actually uh, let us, you know, import some of the very healthy practices that they have been uh, uh, using for a long time now in the in the software uh, development community, like you know, uh, agile updates, uh, rollups, uh, security patches, protocol upgrades, you know, continuous integration, continuous development uh, uh, workflows, DevOps, all these things that are having traditionally alien. Uh, to the to the telco environment right now but uh, especially in the run right now we can actually import them and, and implement them and, and and get the gains uh, that that they have right so uh, that's and and also very importantly this also led us to tailor uh, the development or the implementation or, or the instantiation of of virtualized base stations to the needs of the of the of the verticals, right? Uh, you know, uh, also supporting uh, the 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 ability to create private networks, which are actually tailored to the needs to the to the to the actual tail uh, to actual vertical, and we can do this because the base stations really are softwareized, so we can actually uh, uh, make them tailor made for their needs. And the last advantage is the fact that uh, we have or we have the possibility. Uh, through ORAN, for example, or, or, or the other initiatives to create open interfaces between the different components of base station, right? As you surely know uh, by now, so the architecture of the RAN for 5G is decoupled into, into three elements, the radio unit, which is the actual antenna and some basic uh, radio, uh, RF uh, processing, the distributed unit with the lower uh, fun functions of the of the protocol stack, which is typically closed uh, by the uh, by the antennas and a cloud unit with with the with the higher layers higher layers of the of the protocol stack, with open interfaces between them. What does this mean? This means that actually we can create a more uh, an environment which is more heterogeneous in terms of the manufacturers that uh, uh, take part of the ecosystem of the radio access network. Right now, instead of having just a, a manufacturer, uh, you know, deploying the whole radio access network, we can have uh, different manufacturers, you know, uh, participating of this ecosystem. And what's very important to compete for this ecosystem, which, as you know, this this opens the door for further innovation and also new new business opportunities. So that's why we care a lot uh, uh, about virtualized runs in in, in five growth, right? Uh, and now I would like to, 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 to mention that, of course, virtualizing the RAN is, is, is intrinsically challenging, way more challenging than uh, virtualizing the core. Um, well, uh, the, the, the one key evidence of this is that uh, virtualization of the core, you know, is already there. Uh, and it can be used already. It's, it's, it's an actual product on, on most of the, of the telco manufacturers, while virtual, while virtual RANs are actually not there yet. Why uh, is it more challenging? Well, there are many reasons for that. Uh, and the most important one is that it's very hard to predict 
the needs of computing capacity that the base station needs at every given time. And, and to, to, to actually make an evidence of this, uh, I'm gonna show you first some results of a, a prototype system that we have in our lab, okay? Uh, and, uh, a very simple experiment is represented by this colorful heat map here. Uh, so essentially in this experiment, I only have one, one virtualized uh, 4G base station connected to a regular phone, okay? And what I'm doing in this experiment, I'm just transmitting from the phone in the uplink towards the base station at full buffer, so as much as I can, right? And all I'm changing in the base station is the actual modulation coding scheme that, that the base station allows the user uh, to use. As you know, if, if you're, uh, if you, uh, in case you are not a radio expert, essentially a higher modulation coding scheme allows you to transmit a, a higher density of bits per unit of time, right? So, 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 so have higher throughput, but of course, higher modulation coding schemes require uh, having a better channel better channel conditions that if you were using a lower modulation coding scheme that gives you, on the other hand, uh, lower throughput. This can, be, this can be seen or we change this modulation coding scheme in the y-axis through three different levels, through the minimum, which is zero, that gives you the lowest throughput performance but higher reliability to the highest value uh, of, of, of our experiment, which gives you a higher throughput but uh, lower uh, reliability. And in the x-axis, what we are doing is we are assigning different percentages of the computing system that we have uh, for this base station. In this case, from 40% of, of one single CPU core uh, up to 70% of this CPU core, okay? And as you can see here, and in the colors essentially represent the throughput that we can achieve, relative throughput, right? Where the highest 100% is essentially throughput that we should get if we use the, the highest modulation coding scheme, uh, which is of course in the right uh, top corner of, of this plot. Obviously, if we reduce the modulation coding scheme, we also reduce graciously uh, the, the, the throughput that we gain uh, from this system. What is probably more interesting for, uh, in this case is what happens if we move uh, towards, the, uh, towards the left uh, in the x-axis uh, when we reduce the amount of computation, the, the, the amount of computer resources that we allocate to the station. So what you can see clear is, what you can see clear is a clear boundary, okay? Uh, um, uh, from which actually we get zero throughput, right? If we keep reducing the amount of computing resources that we do, and this, this amount of computing resources that the base station need in this case is higher, the higher the modulation code scheme. And this is rather intuitive. Uh, I, I don't think I'm gonna surprise anything, uh, anybody uh, by this result. Of course, if you are transmitted with a higher density of bits per unit of time, it is evident that uh, uh, for the base station to, to decode, demodulate and decode the, this, this very dense uh, pieces of data, so you, I need, or the base station needs, more computing resources. Nothing new. And in fact, this is rather linear and predictable. So, so this is actually doable. But of course, the, this setup, the setup for this experiment is very simple. As I said, it's just an uplink experiment where the user is transmitted as much as, it, uh, as the user can with very good channel conditions. The problem is that in real life, we don't have these perfect ideal conditions or, or very predictable uh, conditions, right? So in, in, in real time, we have a variety of conditions that actually makes it hard to predict the amount of computing resources that we, that we have. So to, to, to show a little bit uh, on this, I have more experiments here. Uh, uh, first, on the top three plots, uh, I'm, I'm actually running the base station on, on, on a certain computing platform, doesn't matter the, the name, with different uh, speed of the processor. In the three bottom plots, I just have exactly the same context, the same, the same, the same scenarios, but just in a different computing platform. And the first thing that you can see at plain sight without going too much details because there's no need for it, is that this pattern or this boundary where the base station works or not, substantially changes depending on the platform, right? So you, you already need to know beforehand uh, or you need to calibrate beforehand uh, where you're gonna place your base station in order to be sure that your base station is gonna work or not for a given allocation of resources or in order to give the base station enough computing, computing resources, you need beforehand or you need to pre calibrate beforehand the base station to the platform 
uh, where you have it. And this limits already a little bit, you know, the flexibility that we are supposed to gain by virtualized runs, because, okay, we need all this calibration beforehand, or we have this coupling between the base station and the general purpose computing platform, where, where the idea of virtualization is to decouple uh, hardware from software, right? But the situation is even more complicated than this. So in the different columns of this plot, I'm just changing the, the channel quality, essentially by placing the, the, the user farther away from the base station. From high SNR means that the user, the user is very close to the base station, low SNR means that the, the user is very far away from the base station. And of course, these patterns change. And these patterns change depending on the channel quality and depending on the computing platform. So this, imagine a real scenario where users are mobile, right? They move uh, rather quick, and um, so it's very hard to actually predict on what situation you are at, right? Of course, this is even worse than that. So this is about channel conditions. This is about computing platform. But of course, of course, the applications that the user are actually using affect the amount of computing resources that the base station needs. And this is even uh, more complicated for you know this generation runs because we are moving towards situations where networks are very dense which means that every single instance of base station, even if they are tailor-made for, for, for a specific purposes for an industrial application, for example, they're handling just a bunch of users. You know, we are not, we are not gonna have any more, uh, uh, especially, uh, especially in private networks, macro cells covering uh, you know, thousands of users, right? Uh, we're moving towards a scenarios where virtualized base stations are handling just a few users. This means that the actual applications being used by the user, specifically the, the patterns of the, of the network demand that these applications have, affect the amount of computation that this base station needs. And in this experiment, essentially having the same two platforms at the top and, the bot and at the bottom, and in the columns, I, I'm just leaving very good channel quality conditions here, and in the columns, I'm just changing the amount of the average uh, load in bits per second, from 10% to 70%, so very low load and very high load. And what's very interesting to observe here is that, again, once again, so this boundary where the base station works or not, depending on the amount of computing resources that we allocate to the base station, substantially change. And it also loses this linearity that actually would allow us to, 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 to learn uh, better, uh, you know, these patterns, right? So all these experiments essentially are here to motivate the fact that very simple optimization approaches will not work. Uh, for allocation problems or uh, resource allocation problems in virtualized RAMs, okay? Which also makes it very, makes it very challenging to actually have virtualized RAMs, uh, uh, or, you know, functional for, for real life operations. So here, what we adv advocate for is to use the machine learning, right? So we use, uh, here what we're gonna present now is the, the implementation of a, of, a, of a more or less complex deep learning uh, engine uh, to actually learn uh, the needs of the computing demands that the, the, the different base stations or virtual base stations that we have in the, in the VRAN system may need uh, depending on the context. And this is what I'm, I'm gonna demonstrate today. So just very quickly, so you have a, a vision of, of what the, our prototype does. So essentially, uh, we have a system brain uh, that first thing it does is collects continuously information from the different base stations or virtual base stations that we have in the system. This is what you can see here at the left hand side, right? So specifically we have two types, two types of information. So we, what we collect from the base stations are the buffer states, okay? And this, if we are in the uplink, like in, in our example here, in our prototype here, essentially this comes from buffer state reports uh, fed back uh, by the different users are uh, periodic times. Okay, and we call it this for every base station, virtual base station that we have in the system, and for every user uh, of every base station that we have in the user. And we do the same for the channel quality. Okay, in the uplink it's easy, uh, so we have actual uh, signal to noise ratio samples for every single piece of data that is transmitted from the users uh, towards the base station, and we collect this as time series uh, for every single user and every single uh, base station in the system. Okay, what we do then, periodically we collect this information and we feed it uh, to what we have called here is a, a resource manager, which is really brain or the engine, the intelligence of our system here, which is a, a compound or a, a more or less comp complex structure of, of neural networks that do different functions. I'm not gonna go into details just to actually get faster to the actual demonstration, but of course I'm happy 
to, to, to say a few words later if you're interested or offline about the details of the actual internal frame. But things like the DAT, these neural networks, there, there are some of them that what they, uh, their job is essentially to reduce the dimensionality of the, of the, of the, of the, of the context space. So as, as I said, we are constantly, continuously monitoring uh, signal to noise radio samples from all the users and all the vestiges in the system and also the buffer state reports. This actually creates a very large uh, piece of information, a vector, a very large vector. Uh, that is typically hard to, to, to handle. So the first thing we do is we compress it. And to do that, we use uh, deep sparse autoencoders. Uh, just for example, there are, we have some other uh, neural networks. What they do is uh, we have classifiers to try to, 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 to compute uh, uh, the different resources and so on. So I'm happy to, to talk more detail later about this. I don't think this, we, we need to do this now. What's very important for you to understand is that from the context, so what we try to do is to map every single context, which compress and encode somehow, into uh, two sets of policies, okay? First policies are CPU control policies, which is essentially the amount or the percentage of CPU that we allocate to every single virtual visitation that we have in the system, okay? And the other set of policies are radio control policies. And this is uh, perhaps uh, a more novel or, or, or uh, type of policy, which essentially in this case consists of an upper bound uh, modulation coding scheme that is eligible by the MAC schedulers of the base station. So essentially we are imposing a constraint on the maximum modulation coding scheme that the base station can use. And we do this and optimize both CPU control policies and radio control policies jointly to control the amount of computation, uh, the amount of computing resources that the base stations demand. So we do a joint optimization, really. Of course, then we feed these policies into, into the actual base stations. Uh, again, without entering details, uh, for the con uh, CPU control policies, we are using uh, legacy Docker APIs. So we put each uh, instance of base station into a Docker container, and we use the legacy uh, API of Docker to actually uh, allocate computing resources. Uh, for the radio control policies, we've made a, a mild modification to the MAC scheduler of, of a LTV station prototype that we have, uh, essentially to restrict the, the amount, to restrict the highest modulation coding scheme that the MAC scheduler can assign uh, to the users at every, given, at every given time. Okay? So, now so then, once we map a context into a set of policies, we enforce these policies, and we collect at the same time uh, performance KPIs, right? So we need to do this for the training phase, the typical closed loop uh, phase, uh, the typical closed loop of reinforcement learning and that I'm pretty sure you're very familiar with, right? So we keep my performance metrics, different performance metrics, and uh, there's no need to, to get into details unless you're interested later on. Uh, we compute a reward, so essentially we, we compute a number uh, which tell, tells us how good uh, our current mapping function between context and policy is, and we feed, back, feed this back to, to, uh, to Brain actually to, to fine tune the internal policies to, to, to learn and do better uh, every time. So this is all I wanted to say about, you know, introduction and slides. I think it's about time that we got into the actual demonstration. So for that, let me actually uh, change the screen here. Okay, so here I have, uh, in the demonstration, I, I have two tabs, let's say, or, or two, 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 two screens. And the first one is what we call dashboard, okay? It's essentially the, the knobs that we can tune for this demo. Uh, specifically, uh, we have a, a, a setup where we can change the, virtual, uh, the, 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 the scenario of the virtual radio access network uh, to have either one or two virtualized base stations. At the moment, I have already running uh, the case of one base station, okay? Uh, I, I will show you later on what happens when we have two. And then uh, for this base station, we can change different things, okay? For example, we can change the average load bits per second that the, that the base station has to handle. If we can actually put any number. Uh, by default, I have a, a, you know, a, a synthetic dynamic pattern that uh, varies over time. But of course, we can change this if you are interested, interested on that. So we can change the actual uh, transmission power of the, of the user 
this essentially mimics or emulates distance, different distances uh, between the user and the base station. The higher the higher the transmission power, the higher the channel quality, and emulates that the user is closer to the base station, have better condi channel conditions, better coverage. And this parameter Q at the left is essentially a value that let let us tell brain uh, or let us give brain some sense of priority of of some sense of how much we care about uh, wasting resources for this base station versus performance right so for example if we assign uh, uh, this quality of service uh, number or parameter to the highest value to one we are telling brain that we don't care about cost we don't care about competing resources we have plenty what i care is about performance so as i will show you later on brain will actually react to that by actually assigning a lot of competing resources to guarantee that performance of the station is very high. On the other hand, if I assign a very low uh, uh, Q parameter, I'm telling frame that I do care a lot about uh, cost, about competing resources, maybe because I don't have that many or because uh, the, 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 this is a private base station and, and the vertical is not paying enough. Uh, so essentially, learn is, uh, brain is going to react to that by actually uh, reducing the amount of throughput that the base station can handle uh, because at, that, at the same time uh, we can reduce the amount of competent resources that we assign uh, to the base station. So, but, very important, but very importantly, Bren will actually do all these allocation, joint allocations of competing resources and, and, and radio resources without compromising, with, without compromising connectivity. Okay, so one uh, key parameter that we keep track on uh, in, in brain is uh, the, decoding, the amount of decoding errors that we have because we have deficit of computer resources. Essentially, brain guarantees that we never have decoding errors because the amount of radio resources that base station is using are demanding more computing resources than the ones we have, which is what will happen with legacy uh, MAC schedulers without any uh, centralized control. And this is what I'm going to demonstrate right now. So in the second tab, I actually have a monitoring dashboard. You can see a lot of plots, a lot of plots, uh, but probably more important ones are the ones at, the, at this moment are the ones at the left. So at the top, I'm just showing system reward, which is a number between zero and 100%, which essentially tells us how good we are doing in our decision making. Uh, and also putting in blue, in, in purple, the amount of CPU resources that we are saving uh, at the moment and in the system, and, and that, of course, evolves over time. So then at the bottom, I have a performance, met, performance information and also uh, information about the policies that at the moment are implemented for the two base stations that we can have in the system. At the right-hand side, you don't see any move, essentially because, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, I have a disabled base station two at the moment. We are, uh, at the moment, we only have uh, one, one base station, one base station in the system. So this is the case that we have currently. So we have plenty of capacity and uh, we only have one base station running. That's why we, you only have, uh, you only see plots in the left hand side. So if, hopefully you can see my mouse, uh, out of the three plots uh, that you can see at the left moving right now, so the, higher, the, the one at the top is, is uh, related to radio resources. Okay, in, in green, what you can see is the policy that Vrem is imposing to this base station. At the moment, because we have very good channel conditions and our Q parameter is, is high enough, Vrem uh, is actually assigning the highest possible policy, which essentially means that Vrem is not restricting, is not constraining the amount of radio resources that we allow the base station to use. This is, this is what you can see in yellow. In yellow is the actual uh, modulation coding scheme used at the moment by the base station. And this is done uh, by the legacy MAC scheduler of the base station. We are not changing that, okay? Only to obey the policy. But the uh, base station is selecting the modulation coding scheme that it considers uh, for the moment, right? And because we are not restricted in, uh, restricting the modulation coding scheme and we have good channel conditions, this you can see here in this in this kind of, uh, plot in the middle. You can see that we have kind of 30 dBs, which is good channel conditions. The, the base station can actually select high modulation in this case. In between, in the middle, uh, you have performance metrics and policies related to computing. And the same, in green is the policy 
essentially the amount of computing resources that we assign at every given time, point in time. And in yellow is the actual demand of resources. As you can see, because uh, there is some margin between the green and the yellow, okay, because uh, with, the, with the quality of service parameter that we have configured, uh, we are kind of favoring performance over, over computing savings, and therefore brain reacts to that to assigning, you know, uh, not the highest amount of computer resources that we could allocate. Brain is not, as you can see here, Brain is not assigning 100% of computer resources to the station, but it's granting a margin to actually be sure that if there is a sudden peak, a sudden peak of demand, you know, uh, this this wouldn't affect uh, performance. Okay. At the bottom, what you can see is information related to throughput and load. Okay. In green is the actual demand of the user. As, you, as, as I mentioned earlier, uh, by default, I'm just creating a synthetic uh, load pattern that goes down and up or continuously all the time. And in yellow is the actual throughput uh, that we achieve at the moment. Okay. And of course, because we have plenty of computing resource, computing capacity, now we have only one base station, and the amount of computing resources that this, need, this base station needs are consider, considerably lower than 100 percent so it's actually we have enough computing capacity and uh, uh, with our configuration we are actually allowing the base station to have very high performance of course we can change this for example if i assign even larger q parameter this is what I'm, I'm doing now in the dashboard what you will see is that brain will react to assign even larger margins of computing resources to be to have to take even less risks uh, in case of sudden surges of computational demand, right? Uh, because by increasing this parameter, we are telling brain that we don't care at all about costs, we don't care at all about computer resources. So then brain is actually taking higher risk, uh, uh, lower risks at the cost, uh, sorry, at the, at the penalty of costs, right? Because we are using more resources. You can see here that the green plot has increased substantially, almost to 100%. So we are allocating the whole. Uh, CPU, the, the, the whole system for this base station. But of course I can do uh, the other way around. I actually tell base station because this is a private base station that is actually not, it's not a golden member or, or whatever, it's, it's not paying enough. I'm telling him I'm, I, this base station only requires connectivity, very basic connectivity. Uh, so what I want to do is to save operational costs for this base station as much as possible uh, because the private vertical, you know, is depending on the business model, you know, is uh, we have configured in this way. So this is something that we can do here. Uh, what Brain is going to do is going to actually reduce a lot the amount of computing resources, even lower than the demand that we had previously. And what you will see now is specific, particularly when the when the uh, when the base station load peaks right, uh, the base station doesn't really have enough, or, or the system doesn't have enough, or the base station doesn't have enough computing allocation to handle peak loads at highest performance, right? And you can see here is that the throughput, the yellow at the bottom, the yellow area here is much lower than the demand. The demand is green, the throughput performance is the yellow, right? However, the bit error rate is still zero. This plot shows here the bit error rate, amount of, of the coding errors that we have in the system, and this is a very important metric. It has to be zero at all times. So what Brain does in order to support very low computing allocations, okay, at the cost of performance, is to actually reduce the amount of radio resources that we grant to these base stations. So you can see here in, in, in green and yellow, uh, the policy, the radio policy that we are uh, giving to the base station is very low. So the maximum amount, the maximum modulation scheme that, that we allow the base station to use is very low in order for us to contain the amount of computing resources that this base station needs. Okay. So this is one use case. We can actually uh, fine tune, you know, this trade-off between uh, operational costs and performance, depending on what the, what the tenant or the vertical or the owner of the actual base station pays, for example. Uh, the next use case, I would like to show another use case before before we close here, which is the case with, with two base stations. To that, let me close and restart the demo with two base stations. This is going to take uh, maybe half a minute. 
So now what we are doing, we have, instead of having one uh, stacks, virtual stacks, we have two stacks, and therefore we have two sets of nodes. So we can change all the parameters for each of the virtual base stations that we have in the system. And by default, they are essentially their context. So the loads and also their configurations, the channel quality are identical. So just uh, by default, and to start with a, a very simple case, both base stations will see exactly the same demand of, of radio resources. This, okay, now they're connected. So I am gonna clean this up and I'm gonna start, I'm gonna restart the, actually the, the monitoring. Just give it a few seconds so we have enough monitoring information to, to see something. Uh, but you, what you will see is now we have performance metrics and, and policy metrics in the left hand side for base station one and the same for base station two. Now at the, at the right hand side for base station two, you will not see a uh, yellow area and this is a, limit, a limitation of this specific demo is because we don't have a radio unit for base station two. We have the actual protocol stack running, virtualized and running on the VRAN system, but, but we don't have, unfortunately for this demo, we don't have the, the radio unit attached, so I cannot measure actual throughput performance. But Brain is, uh, we are emulating uh, the actual radio unit, and Brain is actually operating as, as the actual radio unit were there. And actually the actual protocol stack, the rest of the protocol stack uh, is deployed and, and running. It's just the radio unit that is, is not there. So what you can see here is that now we have two base stations uh, that are sharing a single CPU core. Okay, maybe you remember from the previous uh, from the, for, from the previous uh, set of experiments is that at peak load, uh, one base station needs way more than fifty percent of the of the CPU core. Of course, now since we have two, we cannot have we cannot assign we cannot assign seventy percent of CPU to both base stations. And since the conditions, the context, and also the parameters that we have by default in this system are essentially identical for both base stations, what Brain is doing is, assign, is essentially assigning exactly 50%, this is the green plot here, and the green plot at the left, 50% to each of the base stations. But of course, this is not enough to, to, to offer higher, highest performance to the base stations. So when, when, when the demand of both base stations peak, and they do at the same time because, well, I'm generating the, the, the synthetic patterns in this way. What Brain is doing is reducing the radio policies to both base stations, right? When the base, sta when, when the base stations load peak in order to ensure that the amount of computing resources that we have in the system are enough. So we can do it. What happens if we use legacy radio schedulers? We, if we don't really optimize jointly computing and radio resources. So for that, I'm gonna actually uh, click here, which essentially uh, frees the base station from obeying the radio policies that brain are imposing. And because we have very good channel conditions, the base stations by default are gonna try to use the, higher, the highest modulation coding scheme possible. And what you will see is that when the load peaks, there is no enough computing resources in the system to actually respect uh, the, the, this, this very high modulation coding schemes. And what you will see when, when, when we get to the peak in both cases, uh, you, you see it now, the bit error rate of the system grows very high. And essentially the base station disconnects completely. That's why you don't see, you don't see samples, monitoring samples anymore. We cannot measure samples anymore because the base station has disconnected from the system because there is not enough computing resources to actually serve the user at these very high modulation coding schemes. You can see that here at the left, the user has tried, has attempted to use very high modulation coding schemes. And therefore, the, 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 the computational demand here, you can see increased the, the boundary or the limit that we have of 50%. Okay. So that's why it's very important to actually in VRANs to generally optimize computing and radio resources. So I'm gonna turn off this, this uh, freedom that I'm giving to the base stations to from obeying my, my policy. I'm gonna reconnect the base station. Okay, now this is happening and what you can see, Brain is actually asking to use lower modulation schemes. Now the base stations are obeying. We have enough computing resources 
uh, to, to manage the traffic of both stations. And this actually is useful for scenarios where you can actually uh, save capital costs or, or consolidate uh, many base stations, low cost base stations into as fewer uh, computing cores as, 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 as possible, for example. Or, or use cases where you want to deploy very um, low cost uh, base stations in, I don't know, very uh, CPU constrained devices. This is just another use case uh, that is open uh, by, you know, the optimization of, of but B runs in the first place and by a joint optimization of computing resources, resources in the second place. Uh, I'm going to stop here. Uh, of course, there are many things, many more things that I could show you, different nodes, uh, different, actually, I could have different priorities for different base stations, but I think, uh, I think I've, I've, been, I've been talking for, for a while now. I think, uh, I think it's enough, it's already 12.30, but I'm very happy uh, to answer any questions that you may have or even, you know, change configurations and see what happens if, if, if you so wish. Thank you very much, Andres. Uh, that's been very, very good. So, um, as you mentioned, now it's time if, if anybody has any question or any request to, to do any change on the configuration and, and go through that, please uh, do it all on the chat. I guess, uh, as you mentioned, that uh, people can also contact you offline uh, yes. and, and make questions, and uh, I, I'm sure you will be happy to to address those. So then I think since I don't see any question popping up, I think it's time to, to close it here. So thanks very much all the attendees and all the speakers for, for this uh, very nice first event of the webinars uh, series. And I don't know if, um, if uh, guys from layer one to three want to, to say anything else to, to close. Yes, thank you, Carlos. Um, I'd like to thank Carlos and I'd like to thank all the 5G project speakers. Um, it's a very thoroughly enjoyable and informative insight into um, what the 5G growth project is doing. Um, I'd also like to express my thanks to the listeners today. Um, just a quick thing, we'll be sending a follow-up email with a poll around the webinar. So please do partake in that as your feedback is always very much appreciated. Um, and if you have any questions for any of the speakers around any of the material, um, we'd be so happy to pass that along. Um, we also look forward to our future Layer 1, 2, 3 and 5G Growth Project webinars that will provide you with um, progress updates and case studies around what's happening. Um, finally, um, just that the Layer 1, 2, 3 World Congress will be taking place um, as a blended event this year in 2020. And that will take place on the, 14, uh, sorry, the 12th to the 15th of October. So please view the agenda speakers and register online via the Layer 1, 2, 3 website um, and via the link that we'll be sending um, in the follow-up email. Um, thank you to everyone, and we look forward to welcoming you back in the near future.